Okay. Some of you have, I'm going down, some of you have parents. Parents gave you some of your paradigms. Why? Because they love you and they want you to survive in the world. So they gave you these lessons of life. Don't do that. Don't go there. Put that down. Don't say that. Don't go over there. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't climb up there. Don't sit on that. Don't go down there. Don't go up there. Get down from there. Don't say that. Don't speak up. Big boys don't cry. <laughs> and so this don't, 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 don't is to keep us safe. Right? We should be blessed if we have parents that tell us to keep us safe. Over the years, this becomes ingrained in our brain. Then we go to school. What does school teach us? Right answers. So if you understand education, then we're given facts, figures, statistics to memorize. Whoever memorizes the most right answers is deemed the most intelligence. The problem is talking isn't teaching, listening isn't learning, and the memorization of answers is no indication of your intelligence or ability. Right? Right. So then we're sent to these factories called the public education system. This is now you're hearing my personal point of view on public education. My, my personal point of view is, edu do we all learn different things in different ways at different speeds? Yeah, so it's a customized product that's mass produced. <coughs> right? So you've got elementary, junior high, high school. What's the product that comes out of there? Be good, do as you're told, Make good grades and get a good what? Job. So how's that working out? Do you have this other video? So it worked for years. You own a trade, become a specialist. You go get a good job, you work there, decade after decade. You're done, they pay you. They pay you from the time you leave there to the time you die. There's two methods of payment, Social Security and pension. Great program. Some of your parents and grandparents probably benefited from that. My father-in-law worked for Ford. He retired at 55. He got a check every month. He passed away. My mother-in-law survived him by 20-some odd years. She got a check every month. Great system. This is a problem, though. The problem, and you can research this, is this. So what the corporations did was these actuarial studies, and what they were finding was people were living longer and longer and healthier and healthier, and the money was running out about here. So since they couldn't kill the people, <laughs> well, they could have. Some of them were trying. It's in the food. <laughs> so instead, they did this. You're on your own. Those pension plans are underfunded by trillions. They're not getting paid. Teachers not, they're not going to get paid. They're not getting paid. So this is called give your money to someone else and hope they make a better decision than you. So it's be good, do what you're told, make good grades, get a job, work hard. There's a highly overrated activity. The key to success is laziness and incompetence. If you're incompetent, nobody asks, well, you, well, no one will ask you to help them. <laughs> if you're good at what you're doing on a pickup, you're helping people move. <laughs> hey, can you help me move? I see you got a pickup. <laughs> so don't own a pickup and don't get, in, don't get competent. <laughs> Laziness. So here's my paradigm. Who can I get to do this for me? Do you think I can do this? Mm -mm. I might could, I want to. 
Shane loves doing this. I don't want to do it. If I do it, we're both unhappy. <laughs> I have to. He doesn't get to. You got two unhappy people out there. Like, let's just both be happy. You do it. I won't. You good? I'm good. <laughs> I love this fucking guy. <laughs> and he turned the two of them. You should see the product they turn out. They're up there laughing, having fun at work. Just having a great time. Okay, you may have seen this. This is, this is what happens if you go through that. Anyway, I'll let you be the judge. Y'all ready? Okay. Another video. Every human used to have to hunt or gather to survive, but humans are smartly lazy, so we made tools to make our work easier. From sticks to plows to tractors, we've gone from everyone needing to make food to modern agriculture with almost no one needing to make food. And yet, we still have abundance. Of course, it's not just farming, it's everything. We've spent the last several thousand years building tools to reduce physical labor of all kinds. These are mechanical muscles, stronger, more reliable, and more tireless than human muscles ever could be. And that's a good thing. Replacing human labor with mechanical muscles frees people to specialize, and that leaves everyone better off, even those still doing physical labor. This is how economies grow and standards of living rise. Some people have specialized to be programmers and engineers whose job is to build mechanical minds. Just as mechanical muscles made human labor less in demand, so are mechanical minds making human brain labor less in demand. This is an economic revolution. You may think we've been here before, but we haven't. This time is different. When you think of automation, you probably think of this. Giant, custom-built, expensive, efficient, but really dumb robots blind to the world and their own work. They were a scary kind of automation, but they haven't taken over the world because they're only cost-effective in narrow situations. But they're the old kind of automation. This is the new kind. Meet Baxter. Unlike these things which require skilled operators and technicians and millions of dollars, Baxter has vision and can learn what you want him to do by watching you do it, and he costs less than the average annual salary of a human worker. Unlike his older brothers, he isn't pre-programmed for one specific job. He can do whatever work is within the reach of his arms. Baxter is what might be thought of as a general purpose robot, and general purpose is a big deal. Think computers. They too start out as highly custom and highly expensive, but when cheap-ish general purpose computers appeared, they quickly became vital to everything. A general purpose computer can just as easily calculate change, or assign seats on an airplane, or play a game, or do anything just by swapping its software. And this huge demand for computers of all kinds is what makes them both more powerful and cheaper every year. Baxter today is the computer of the 1980s. He's not the apex, but the beginning. Even if Baxter is slow, his hourly cost is pennies worth of electricity, while his meat-based competition costs minimum wage. A tenth of the speed is still cost-effective when it's a hundredth the price. And while Baxter isn't as smart as some of the other things we will talk about, he's smart enough to take over many low-skilled jobs. And we've already seen how dumber robots than Baxter can replace jobs. In new supermarkets, what used to be 30 humans is now one human overseeing 30 cashier robots. Or take the hundreds of thousands of baristas employed worldwide. There's a barista robot coming for them. Sure, maybe your guy makes the double mocha whatever just perfect and you'd never trust anyone else, but but millions of people don't care and just want a decent cup of coffee. Oh, and by the way, this robot is actually a giant network of robots that remembers who you are and how you like your coffee no matter where you are. Pretty convenient. We think of technological change as the fancy new expensive stuff, but the real change comes from last decade stuff getting cheaper and faster. That's what's happening to robots now. And because their mechanical minds are capable of decision-making, they are out-competing humans for jobs in a way no pure mechanical muscle ever could. Imagine a pair of horses in the early 1900s talking about technology. One worries all these new mechanical muscles will make horses unnecessary. The other reminds him that everything so far has made their lives easier. Remember all that farm work? Remember running from coast to coast delivering mail? Remember riding into battle? All terrible. These new city jobs are pretty cushy, and with so many humans in the cities, there will be more jobs for horses than ever. Even if this car thingy takes off, he might say, there will be new jobs for horses we can't imagine. But you, dear viewer, from beyond 2000, know what happened. There are still working horses, but nothing like before. 
The horse population peaked in 1915. From that point on, it was nothing but down. There isn't a rule of economics that says better technology makes more better jobs for horses. It sounds shockingly dumb to even say that out loud, but swap horses for humans and suddenly people think it sounds about right. As mechanical muscles pushed horses out of the economy, mechanical minds will do the same to humans. Not immediately, not everywhere, but in large enough numbers and soon enough that it's going to be a huge problem if we're not prepared. And we're not prepared. You, like the second horse, may look at the state of technology now and think it can't possibly replace your job, but technology gets better, cheaper, and faster at a rate biology can't match. Just as the car was the beginning of the end for the horse, so now does the car show us the shape of things to come. Self-driving cars aren't the future. They're here and they work. Self-driving cars have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles up and down the California coast and through cities all without human intervention. The question is not if they'll replace cars, but how quickly. They don't need to be perfect, they just need to be better than us. Human drivers, by the way, kill 40,000 people a year with cars just in the United States. Given that self-driving cars don't blink, don't text while driving, don't get sleepy or stupid, it's easy to see them being better than humans because they already are. Now, to describe self-driving cars as cars at all is like calling the first cars mechanical horses. Cars in all their forms are so much more than horses that using the name limits your thinking about what they can even do. Let's call self-driving cars what they really are. Autos, the solution to the transport objects from point A to point B problem. Traditional cars happen to be human-sized to transport humans, but tiny autos can work in warehouses and gigantic autos can work in pit mines. Moving stuff around is who knows how many jobs, but the transportation industry in the United States employs about 3 million people. Extrapolating worldwide, that's something like 70 million jobs at a minimum. These jobs are over. The usual argument is that the unions will prevent it, but history is filled with workers who fought technology that would replace them, and the workers always lose. Economics always wins, and there are huge incentives across wildly diverse industries to adopt autos. For many transportation companies, humans are about a third their total costs. That's just the straight salaries. Humans sleeping in their long-haul trucks cost time and money. Accidents cost money. Carelessness costs money. If you think insurance companies will be against it, guess what? Their perfect driver is one who pays their small premiums and never gets into an accident. The autos are coming, and they're the first place where most people will really see the robots changing society. But there are many other places in the economy where the same thing is happening, just less visibly. So it goes with autos, so it goes for everything. It's easy to look at autos and Baxters and think technology has always gotten rid of low-skilled jobs we don't want people doing anyway. They'll get more skilled and do better educated jobs like they've always done. Even ignoring the problem of pushing a hundred million additional people through higher education, white-collar work is no safe haven either. If your job is sitting in front of a screen and typing and clicking, like maybe you're supposed to be doing right now, the bots are coming for you too, buddy. Software bots are both intangible and way faster and cheaper than physical robots. Given that white-collar workers are, from a company's perspective, both more expensive and more numerous, the incentive to automate their work is greater than low-skilled work. And that's just what automation engineers are for. These are skilled programmers whose entire job is to replace your job with a software bot. You may think even the world's smartest automation engineer could never make a bot to do your job, and you may be right, but the cutting edge of programming isn't super smart programmers writing bots, it's super smart programmers writing bots that teach themselves how to do things the programmer could never teach them to do. How that works is well beyond the scope of this video, but the bottom line is there are limited ways to show a bot a bunch of stuff to do, show the bot a bunch of correctly done stuff, and it can figure out how to do the job to be done. Even with just a goal and no knowledge of how to do it, the bots can still learn. Take the stock market, which in many ways is no longer a human endeavor. It's mostly bots that taught themselves to trade stocks, trading stocks with other bots that taught themselves. As a result, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange isn't filled with traders doing their day jobs anymore. It's largely a TV set. So bots have learned the market and bots have learned to write. If you've picked up a newspaper lately, you've probably already read a story written by a bot. There are companies that teach bots to write anything, sports stories, TPS reports, even say those quarterly reports that you write at work. Paperwork, decision-making, writing, a lot of human work falls into that category, and the demand for human mental labor in these areas is on the way down. 
But surely the professions are still safe from bots, yes? When you think lawyer, it's easy to think of trials, but the bulk of lawyering is actually drafting legal documents, predicting the likely outcome and impact of lawsuits, and something called discovery, which is where boxes of paperwork gets dumped on the lawyers and they need to find the pattern or the one out-of-place transaction among it all. This can be bot work. Discovery, in particular, is already not a human job in many law firms. Not because there isn't paperwork to go through, there's more of it than ever, but because clever research bots shift through millions of emails and memos and accounts in hours, not weeks, crushing human researchers in terms of not just cost and time, but most importantly, accuracy. Bots don't get sleepy reading through a million emails. But that's the simple stuff. IBM has a bot named Watson. You may have seen him on TV destroy humans at Jeopardy, but that was just a fun side project for him. Watson's day job is to be the best doctor in the world, to understand what people say in their own words and give back accurate diagnoses. He's already doing that at Sloan Kettering, giving guidance on lung cancer treatments. Just as autos don't need to be perfect, they just need to make fewer mistakes than humans, the same goes for doctor bots. Human doctors are by no means perfect. The frequency and severity of misdiagnoses are terrifying, and human doctors are severely limited in dealing with a human's complicated medical history. Understanding every drug and every drug's interaction with every other drug is beyond the scope of human knowability. Especially when there are research robots whose whole job it is to test thousands of new drugs at a time. And human doctors can only improve through their own experiences. Doctor bots can learn from the experience of every doctor bot, can read the latest in medical research and keep track of everything that happens to all their patients worldwide and make correlations that would be impossible to find otherwise. Not all doctors will go away, but when the doctor bots are comparable to humans and they're only as far away as your phone, the need for general doctors will be less. So professionals, white-collar workers, and low-skill workers all have things to worry about from automation. But perhaps you are unfazed because you're a special creative snowflake. Well, guess what? You're not that special. Creativity may feel like magic, but it isn't. The brain is a complicated machine, perhaps the most complicated machine in the whole universe, but that hasn't stopped us from trying to simulate it. There is this notion that just as mechanical muscles allowed us to move into thinking jobs, that mechanical minds will allow us to move into creative work. But even if we assume the human mind is magically creative, it's not, but just for the sake of argument, artistic creativity isn't what the majority of jobs depend on. The number of writers and poets and directors and actors and artists who actually make a living doing their work is a tiny, tiny portion of the labor force. And given that these are professions dependent on popularity, they'll always be a very small portion of the population. There can't be such a thing as a poem and painting based economy. Oh, by the way, this music in the background that you're listening to, it was written by a bot. Her name is Emily Howell, and she can write an infinite amount of new music all day for free. And people can't tell the difference between her and human composers when put to a blind test. Talking about artificial creativity gets weird fast. What does that even mean? But nonetheless, it's a developing field. People used to think that playing chess was a uniquely creative human skill that machines could never do, right up until the point they beat the best of us. And so it will go for all human talents. Right, this may have been a lot to take in, and you might want to reject it. It's easy to be cynical of the endless and idiotic predictions of futures that never are. So that's why it's important to emphasize again that this stuff isn't science fiction. The robots are here right now. There is a terrifying amount of working automation in labs and warehouses around the world. We have been through economic revolutions before, but the robot revolution is different. Horses aren't unemployed now because they got lazy as a species, they're unemployable. There's little work that a horse can do to pay for its housing and hay. And many bright, perfectly capable humans will find themselves the new horse, unemployable through no fault of their own. But if you still think new jobs will save us, here is one final point to consider. The US Census in 1776 tracked only a few kinds of jobs. Now, there are hundreds of kinds of jobs, but the new ones are not a significant part of the labor force. Here's the list of jobs ranked by the number of people who perform them. It's a sobering list with the transportation industry at the top. Continuing downward, all of this 
this work existed in some form a hundred years ago, and almost all of them are easy targets for automation. Only when we get to number 33 on the list is there finally something new. Don't think that every barista or white-collar worker need lose their job before things are a problem. The unemployment rate during the Great Depression was 25%. The list above is 45% of the workforce. Just what we've talked about today, the stuff that already works, can push us over that number pretty soon. And given that even in our modern technological wonderland, new kinds of work aren't a significant portion of the economy, this is a big problem. This video isn't about how automation is bad, rather that automation is inevitable. It's a tool to produce abundance for little effort. We need to start thinking now about what to do when large sections of the population are unemployable through no fault of their own. What to do in a future where, for most jobs, humans need not apply. Page two. Two-thirds of the way down, underneath humans need not apply video, there are three groups of people in the world. Number one, those who make things happen. Two, those who watch things happen. Those who ask. What happened? <laughs> the goal is to stay out of group three. <laughs> Paradigms and you. Paradigms are also assumptions. See where it says you cannot? The rest of that sentence is this. You cannot question an assumption you don't know you've made. You cannot question an assumption you don't know you've made. What I'm saying here is get off autopilot. So under that it says, therefore we must. This is just... I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life. I'm just telling you what I do, what I see successful people do. Look, I went broke when I was 30, lost everything, broke, divorced, moved to Austin to start over. I became a lifelong learner. I got lucky. I was introduced to this guy named Robert Kiyosaki. I did his seminars. I traveled with him through Australia for six years. Right, Corinne? This is Corinne. She was my personal assistant in Melbourne, Australia. Please say hello to her. Give her a hand. <laughs> When I got to Melbourne, she hauled me around the city and took care of me. She lives in Austin now. I haven't seen her in, what, th 25 years. She just walked into the room. Yeah. I saw her and I went, <laughs> you know what I mean? My parents, she's not supposed to be here. I saw her in Melbourne in 1992. That's the time I saw her. It's 2017. Why is she sitting in my classroom? <laughs> I went, is that her? <laughs> <laughs> it's Corinne. <laughs> so, you, you, so you cannot question an assumption you don't know you've made. Therefore, you must question all assumptions daily. So our parents, they loved us. They gave us these uh, paradigms. Our teachers, they wanted to teach us. They gave us these paradigms. Now everything's changed. What's not changed is subject to change. So what we have to do now is question those assumptions. What was true back then may not be true today. So if you're trying to solve information age problems with an industrial age education, <laughs> the answers may not apply. So I don't want to be right. I just want a result. <clears throat> if that answer isn't right, I'm not married to the answer. I'll let that thing go in a heartbeat. My education system taught me to be right. I don't want to be right. I just want the result. So we're looking at what if how? What if how? What's impossible? Nothing. What if we could do it? How would we do it? What if we could do it? How would we do it? Yeah? So every time you have an assumption, a thought, 
All I'm, all I'm suggesting is you stop and go, wait a minute. Is that my mom? Is that my dad? Is that my teacher? Is that my coach? Is that my coworker? Is that my wife? Is that my husband? Who put that thought in there, and is it true today? Okay, so over the years, we believe all this is real. All these thoughts. A paradigm represents what is real for us. So real becomes reality. Reality becomes the box. The goal is to push the box away. So right now, you're sitting in a big box. <laughs> right? We're all sitting in a box right now. So this is what I call in-the-box thinking. So the Real Estate Commission, do we have that outline? The Real Estate Commission changed all the rules. I'm just giving you an example of what's happened. I'm giving you some examples of other people's paradigms and some videos and other industries and businesses and kind of giving you a sense of how paradigms work. Now I'm going to give you a personal experience of paradigms. This is, do I have a pointer? This is the new um, Trek outline for principles. This is how our courses were redone. This is a Principles Real Estate 1 30-hour course outline. This is Chapter 1, Introduction to Modern Real Estate. Real estate, a business of many professions. Spend 25 minutes on that subject. This is what we're told to teach you. We're going to tell you what to learn. We're going to tell you when you learned it. Education Committee, spend 25 minutes on that. Real estate market, characteristics of real estate, spend 20 minutes on that. Real estate law, spend whatever that says, 30 minutes on that. Professional organizations, spend 20 minutes on that. On and on and on. This is page one, there's five pages. This is what they're telling us to teach you. This is how many minutes we're told, we're told to spend on it. That's the new rule. Argue, whinge, wimp, whine, moan, does no good. What do you do? Adapt. Now we take this, and what do we do? We create a diff we create a product, good product, world class delivery method, good pricing structure. When the rules change, everyone goes back to zero. Your past success guarantees you nothing. So now this is called bushel full of lemons. What do you do when you get a bushel full of lemons? You go buy a juicer. <laughs> so that's what we want to do. So now we just, we'll teach you this. And we're going to tell you why we're teaching you. Your license guarantees you nothing. Those who do the license know that now. It takes you a year to figure it out. You're like, I did all that work to get that license. It doesn't mean a bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I passed my exam. Why isn't my phone ringing? <laughs> Because the marketplace doesn't care what your exam score was. I owe the bank millions. They never asked me for my report card. <laughs> <laughs> What's the adult version of a report card? Financial statement. Where are we taught that? Not the school I came from. Right? Right. That's what we teach. So we're going to teach you how to get your license. We're going to teach you how to build a business. We're going to teach you how to invest your profits. That's what we do. That's why we're called the Real Estate Business School. So that's why I'm glad you're here. Well, thank you again for showing up. If you like this, we're going to do one of these a month. The one we're going to do next month is about money. If you think you know about money, come. You'll discover that you're right, and you may discover some things that you need to learn. Okay? So you have inbox thinking. We have to be able to think in the box because we've got to get a license in order to move forward. Right? Okay, I can turn that off. Thank you. What's missing in the public education system and in the courses we teach for in the box thinking? What's missing? What crucial element? Huh? 
Okay, thank you. That's part of it. What else? The application of the information. So let's say we teach a listing agent course. We hand out the books, you read the books, you take the test, you ace it. You don't know anything about how to list a piece of property. Now you have to go where? Outside and do outside the box thinking, which is called trial and what? Error. Oh, but you can't make mistakes. <laughs> so if you carry that paradigm, what happens is, Not much. Nineteen sixty nine. What worldwide event took place? Huh? Right. Apollo. Man went Apollo space mission. Man landed on the what? Moon. What percentage of the time was the Apollo space capsule on course? What was it doing 97% of the time? This is life. This is how you learn listing presentation. Mistake, correct. Mistake, correct. Mistake, result. You have to have the guts or as Joe Barker says, the courage to change the paradigm. Faith, intuition, courage to go out and sit in that breakfast room knowing you have no idea what you're doing and go through this process of trial and error, mess up 10 to 15 listing presentations, then you become a listing agent. Right? Okay. So here's how you learn. There they are. This should be in your handout. So at the bottom of that page, two types of thinking. Y'all okay? I, okay. Two types, uh, types of thinking, inside the box, outside the box. So learning the exam, state licensing, technical education, great foundation. We need it. Most of the lawsuits and complaints to track come from contract disputes, lack of technical education. So I'm not totally writing it off. We need it. It's a great foundation. You just need more. I was a strong listing agent because just I could work more sellers at one time than I could buyers. You only work one buyer at a time, right? But sellers, I had 30, 40 listings simultaneously. So it sounded like a better idea to me. What my sellers wanted to know is, can you market my home? Can you sell it for top dollar? And would you negotiate for me? They never asked me what my exam score was. They wanted me to have a business education. If you want to become financially independent in real estate, you'll need a financial education. So you need inside the box thinking, outside the box thinking. Okay. And there's two ways to learn. One is memorization. You can learn some things from a book. How to pass a test. Others, trial and error. Trial and error. What's the one reason the big the attrition rate is so high in real estate? <clears throat> The main one. This is bigger than this. <laughs> Remember, 
Everything begins, I'm on the next line there. Everything begins with a thought. It's here. So we have a thought, then we do something. What do we have? That's it. Thank you. Nicely said. So the behavioral scientists want to focus on your what? Behavior. Mm -mm. This. <laughs> this is the source. You have to go to the origin. Yeah? Make sense? Okay, good. <laughs> What's the biggest obstacle to learning? Huh? What's the big biggest obstacle to learning? Good, that's part of it. I already know that. <laughs> you can't teach me anything. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> so when I look at it, we spend about the first 20, 25% of our life being told what to learn and when we learned it. Now we're adults and we get to choose what we want to learn. So what do you need to learn? How to build a team, how to get a result, how to leverage yourself, how to build a business, how to take advantage of the tax code, how to build a marketing campaign that works, the difference between SEO and SEM, how to get the right people, do the right thing at the right time, how to build a team, the difference between cash, cash flow, asset liability, money, wealth, what do you need to learn? And now you get to take responsibility for your own learning. You know when you learn it because it's going to show up. It's called the bank balance. It's a reflection, the adult version of a report card. <laughs> so, and this is one of the greatest things I got from Bucky Mentor was one of my mentors. He said humans are designed to make mistakes. We learn only through trial and error. So this is the hardest paradigm shift that I made because I really was interested in being right and being good and being nice and looking good and going nowhere. <laughs> Mainly because of this, I just decided one day to get myself out of my way. So if you look at this and you go here, and this is how much we know What's out here? Yeah, exactly. Which is greater? What you know or what you don't know? Yeah, you can't know. How do you know you're here? How do you know you've gone from here to here? <laughs> this is when you go, ah, oh, right, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> this is the greatest gift you can get. You just learn something. What are we taught? Justify. Blame someone else. <laughs> and what did Joel says? Where does learning take place? Yeah, see, you hear, here's your edge. That's the boundary, that's the paradigm. 
What's a paradigm? Set of rules. What's the first thing it does? Sets a boundary. Right? So what I'm going to encourage you to do is push beyond the boundary of what you know because learning takes place right here, right at the edge. And push beyond what you know into the unknown. And when you do that, this becomes this. And this grows. And you do it like this. And whoever makes most of these learns the most. That's why it's called that. <laughs> so below that, say everything begins with a thought. Just below that, the most powerful force there is, is what you say to yourself and you believe. So when you say to yourself and you believe, mistakes are good, it's how I learn. Mistakes are good, it's how I learn. <laughs> when I go home and my wife will say, well, how was your day? I go, phew, man, I learned a lot today. <laughs> man, I tore some stuff up. <laughs> the most powerful force you have is what you say to yourself and you believe. So, do you have a biggest obstacle of learning? Below that, what if? So here's my question to you. What if everything you know is wrong? I'm not saying it is. I'm just asking the question. What if it were? So, we decided to shift this learning, paragraph, this learning paradigm. There it is, bottom of page three. What does school teach? Study alone. Take test. Study alone. We teach study on, as a, together as a team. We were putting people in. When we first brought to school, we were young and naive and didn't know anything. So we put the great people together in groups to study. And then we got a complaint, and Trek says, are you having people test in groups? I said, yeah, man, they're having a great time. You should see them in there. They're cooperating. They're learning. They go, that's cheating. You can't do that. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so we quit doing that. Take tests by yourself. And we teach so, uh, pro, uh, uh, problem solving as a team. Um, how many of you have a lawyer, a Tyler company, a lender, a doctor, a um, different professionals on your team? Okay, good. So when you get in trouble, you can go ask them for help, right? Okay, what's that called in school? Cheating. <laughs> so go out and cheat. Become good cheaters. <laughs> I, call it I call it cooperation. <laughs> you can change your answer. We teach making mistakes. Um, school says make good grades. All I'm saying is good grades don't equal success. Um, school says high score is your intelligence. I, my point is the test is not in the classroom. The test isn't in here, and you know that. It's out there. It's a good, a good job. I think we should build a good business. Be a good employee. I'd rather be a good employer. Um, work hard. I think it's a highly overrated activity. There are six ways to leverage yourself. That's the next book that's coming out. I should have it by mid-year. I'm writing a book on leverage and how to do that. Um, I've discovered six ways so far. Um, I was taught to climb the corporate, you know, my school system said, yeah, climb the corporate ladder. My dad says, build your own. <laughs> and then they taught, save your money. Why would you save your money in this environment when interest rates are you're getting The savers, see, here's the problem with the financial system, the economic system we have in America. It punishes savers and rewards debtors. 
It punishes employees and rewards investors and business owners. It punishes employees and savers. So if you go get a good job and save your money, the tax code is going to slaughter you. <laughs> the tax code is built. It was designed to encourage economic growth, expansion. That's why business owners get tax breaks employees don't get. That's why investors get tax breaks homeowners don't get. Take the event next week, next month. We're going to cover these, whole, these topics right here, the difference and how to get through those loopholes. And then um, also school specialization. What are you going to be when you grow up? When I'm five, I don't know. <laughs> firemen? They're cool. I'd love to be a fireman. They don't know any better. Firemen would be great. Are firemen great? They're right, they're great. How about a policeman? How about teachers? How about we pay them more money? So you ask them, what do you want to be? Well, probably 10 things because I'm going to have a job. There's no jobs anymore that last more than five years. So what I'm going to probably be is flexible, I hope. Because <laughs> I can't do what you did. <laughs> okay. And they say wait for, work for money, you know, get a good job. How much are they paying you? What's the job pay? Well, it doesn't matter how much you make, it's how much you spend. It's not on the make side. Wealth is not created on the income side. It's created on the spend side. It doesn't matter how much you make, it's how you spend. We'll go into this too if you want. And then they say make money, and I'm like, no, you don't need to make money, you need to make sense. So my question is to you, when do you measure the success of your education? Graduation or retirement? Because some of you are at the halfway mark. I don't think it's doing so good. So my question is, if this is a game, and it is just a game, because making money is just a game, but you're either master of the game or slave of the game. And the name of this game, get out of the game. So my question is, you're going to play the second half like you played the first? Or do things, or do things need to change? Because the only constant is what I'm finishing now. The world is the world is designed to what? Change. What must you do? Change. When you hear someone saying something crazy, what do you say? That's an interesting point of view. And remember the pig. Remember the story of the pig? I have one last story. I was giving a lecture to a power utility that has nuclear plants. After I finished, David Valeri, Valeri, one of the nuclear training instructors, came up to me and asked what I knew about what had happened at Chernobyl. I said I was aware, as most people are, of the meltdown and the release of radioactivity, but that was all. He said there was another part of the story that very few people knew. And though it was tragic, it illustrated perfectly the kind of paradigm blindness I was talking about. He sent me a paper entitled Chernobyl Notebook, written in June 1989 by G. Medvedev, one of the Soviet scientists who was involved in the post-accident cleanup. The document was an attempt to recreate in a narrative as accurately as possible what had happened at Chernobyl. Mr. Valeri told me to check page 28. At that point, the narrative describes the behavior by the nuclear engineers at the plant shortly after the explosion. The engineers were trying to figure out what happened. The one thing they, quote, knew for sure, end quote, was, the, was that the reactor was still intact. Why? Because from their understanding of the design, they knew it could not have blown up. So they looked outside to see what had happened. All over the ground was the black graphite right out of the core. Massively, fatally radioactive. Quote, something was scattered around the unit on the asphalt, very thickly, something black. But he, referring to Dyatlov, one of the engineers, could not take it into his mind that this was graphite from the reactor. Just as in the turbine room where Dyatlov had just looked, 
His eyes had seen the glowing chunks of graphite and fuel, but his mind would not accept the implication of what he had seen. These three intelligent, well-trained engineers looked right at the proof of a, of a reactor explosion and, there was, and decided as a group there was nothing that indicated an explosion. As far as they were concerned, the reactor was still intact. And based on that belief, the crew chief, Akimov, kept telling people the press included the reactor core was okay. The evidence was literally right before their eyes, and yet because of the deep trust they had in their design, they refused to accept their data for what it was. They all died of a massive radioactive exposure, but what really killed them was the inability to see past their paradigms. Last but least, not least, I'll leave this with you. Last sentence. You never know who's going to be bringing you your future. Joel said, the future the next 10 years are going to be filled with people coming running around corners screaming at you. <laughs> Some things are going to sound crazy. You never know who's going to be bringing you your future. So I'll end the way I started. Thank you for your time. Thank you for financial consideration. I hope to see you again next month. And uh, with that, let's have lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching The Future of Real Estate.